thank you so much, Steve, and, and, and thanks everybody for, for being here and for listening to this very, very exciting discussion. Um, we have a very interesting panel. We called it the regulatory panel, but it's not only a regulatory panel. It's a mixture, so we can bring everything together. And in this panel, we've got several representatives. First and foremost, Luigi Miki, who is the head of strategy and development for Turner, which is the Italian TSO. We all love our spaghetti, we love Italian music, we love Italian movies, and we want Italy to be the bridge between the TSO story, the regulatory story, and the think tank story. And also Luigi is an experimenter. He has two islands. One island, El Hireo, that is already 100% renewable, and is also a UNESCO site, and they managed to do it and prove the concept that it's doable, and they're moving forward with another island where they're even going to have desalination as part of the process. We have an extremely diverse group with many different backgrounds and many languages. And I would like to take this opportunity to give a hand of applause to all of our panelists who spoke in English a whole lot better than we would have been able to speak <laughs> in Italian, French. <clears throat> Thank you. And even Turkish. Our next uh, panelist is, and I'm one of the few people who can probably pronounce his name right, Alparsalan Bayraktar, which means flag bearer in Turkish. And he is the chairman of the International Confederation of Energy Regulators and also commissioner of Energy Markets Regulatory Authority in Turkey. Now, even though Turkey is not part of the EU, and as you notice, they're not interconnected, this is definitely something that is going to be happening in the Europe as we integrate southern uh, states, whether they're European or not, into the energy grid because the energy grids are neutral. So we'll certainly take Russia, we'll take Bulgaria, we'll take Turkey, we'll take anybody who can interconnect and benefit. The next one is Andrew Burgess. He's the Associate Partner Smart Grids and Governance of GEM, who is the regulator in the United Kingdom. And Mr. Burgess is particularly involved in developing the thinking on smarter grids, flexibility, network innovation, and interconnections. Patrick Greichen. Patrick Greichen leads a think tank the Ogora Energy Vende um, uh, Foundation. He comes from the Energy and Environmental Ministry in Germany. While he was responsible for EU climate negotiations and he participated in the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol. Ogora Energy Vende, they kind of made Energy Vende a term of art. We all know that Energy Vende means energy transition, and we all refer to energy transition as Energy Vende not only in, Euro in Germany, but also in Europe as well. And we're very proud to have Patrick here if anybody wants to get the real facts on the energy vendor and energy transition in Germany and now in Europe, talk to Patrick, log on to his website, download the documents. Professor Eike Weber, he's the director of the Fraunhofer Institute in Freiburg, which is one of the largest research institutes in Germany with 60,000 scientists. He is also a professor of physics at the University of Freiburg. He was a professor here at the University of Berkeley for 23 years, and he is the one who received the Future of Energy Zayed Prize last year, which is a very significant recognition. And our panel moderator, by the way, why don't we have our panelists come up and, and take their seats on the chair so we, we have time for discussions, <laughs> and we're not wasting time. Come on up, everybody. And of course, we have our esteemed moderator who needs no introduction. We introduced him yesterday, Michael Leibrick, who is the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. He also serves on the advisory board. He has many, many activities. He's also on um, the Transportation Authority for London. And he is on the advisory board of Women in Sustainability, Environment, and Renewables, which I introduced yesterday. Antonella was a very tough act to follow. She's a great moderator. It was a wonderful panel that we had. But if anyone can follow this, draw conclusions, and make sure that as we move forward towards more integration, towards more regionalism, towards a more decarbonized grid, we're learning from the best, we're cooperating, and we can continue to learn from each other as this process, as this process evolves. So thank you again, and welcome, Michael. You, Mike. Thank you very much, Angelina. Thank you. And um, 
I don't quite know what I did to get this, uh, this, this role here because I'm now the last person uh, between you and lunch. And uh, the good news is we already know what's on the uh, menu for lunch. Uh, we're going to have a little uh, spaghetti starter. Uh, the main course will be duck, and then for dessert, we're going to get chocolate to keep the uh, food theme going. I also just want, before we get started, I want to make one other comment. Um, uh, Angelina has, uh, has noted that I'm uh, on the advisory board of this thing called WISER, the uh, Women in Sustainability, Environment, and Renewables. And it was really thrilling, genuinely thrilling, to arrive this morning and see that the, th the first three big roles up here on stage was Commissioner Lafleur, Governor Galutova, and then the incomparable uh, Antonella Battaglini. So uh, I think a round of applause for that. And, and you, can all tell your, you can all tell your daughters that energy leadership, uh, you know, is, is a, this is, this is a, an aspiration they should all absolutely have. Um, so uh, we've got a fabulous panel. Angelina, thank you very much for introduction. So what I'm going to do actually is um, it, it, we'll get started. Some of you have slides, some of you have, uh, don't. Uh, but we're going to do little introductions, and then we're going to try and keep it as interactive as possible. Uh, if time allows, you'll have a chance to ask some questions. And we will both talk about regulation and also try and summarize in some way uh, some of the themes that have been uh, discussed that have that just recurred time and again over the last day and a half. So our first uh, panelist, Patrick, would you like to take the floor? I don't know if you're going to do it from there. or Yes, you're going to do it from there, even though I think you've got a, a slide or two. So over to you. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, maybe I'd like to uh, give a few insights on where we actually stand in Germany, because uh, there has been a lot of talk about overgeneration uh, these these two days, and uh, I mean we will hit 30% renewables, out of which 20% are variable this year, and therefore we had lots of those situations where we had uh, high shares of renewables. Um, the, the the highest have was 84% uh, uh, of, cons of consumption in this August. Um, now, I don't know whether the slides actually are there. Um, yes. Um, last Christmas, we had a 60% renewable situation. Um, and you saw a lot of wind coming in uh, from uh, December uh, 21 to December 25. And then suddenly there was no wind anymore on the 26th. And what you see on the left side is the power production, uh, the red curve being the demand. And on the right side, uh, you see basically how that is matched by the power market price on the power exchange. Uh, and that is very neatly, you can see basically what the fossil or the conventional power fleet, how they reacted according to the power price at the power exchange. Um, so that, that is to say, Although we had 60% renewables, there was no overproduction. There was very flexible reaction of our fleet, depending on the power market price, which even was negative at some hours, right? I mean, if you look at the right sky, sky, uh, scale, it was uh, minus uh, 30 euros uh, at some point. But that doesn't really matter. I mean, at other times it's higher, and that's basically then signaling uh, what to do. And if you look at the next slide, we have that famous situation of the eclipse. That was what actually happened uh, uh, at, at, nine, uh, at, at 10 o'clock. It all went uh, away and came back up at, at 12. Um, and you saw on the right-hand side uh, what happened on the intraday market. Lots of trades, volumes got up on the intraday market. Uh, the power price went from up to 500 euros per megawatt hour to down to minus 150 euros per megawatt hour. Um, and that's what those traders did, and that was basically trading flexibility. So um, this is to say, um, get lots of actors to involve on that power exchange, uh, both from the demand side and from the supply side, and have them feel their marginal cost. And as soon as you get that uh, into your uh, regulation system, however you do it, I mean, uh, every, every consistency has a different way, um, 
then you'll find out that there's lots of flexibility out there. Uh, yesterday, I, I spoke to someone uh, who was saying that there are lots of uh, hydro uh, water pumps here in California, um, a, la a large share of demand. Well, that's, that's a great source of flexibility, as long as you have them operate on the same uh, market as the rest. And then one last slide. Um, because I only have limited time here, um, more, more information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on our website, if you want to. Um, next slide is not on. OK. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick. And, and the website, do you want to just say, what is the website, just in case, because uh, this is being streamed live, so people um, Yeah, it, we're called Agora Energiewende, so it's agora-energiewende.org. OK, and everybody here knows how to spell Energiewende. So, uh, but could, um, could you do one thing for us? Um, you said get the flexibility into the system, however it works. Could you just give a couple of examples where the regulator intervened or, or had an initiative that helped create the system that enabled specifically I'm thinking I think the Eclipse one is the is the most dramatic and, and sharpest uh, in, uh, price signals what did the regulator do to enable that in Germany just a couple of things well first of all I mean we, we allowed for negative prices to happen uh, and uh, so the, so minus 500 and plus 3,000 is basically the bounds uh, second because of the renewables are sold into the uh, day ahead market um, that's a liquid market, right? So that's why all others are also participating on that day ahead market because they know uh, when there's lots of uh, renewables that day ahead price is going to be low. Um, so uh, have basically both uh, uh, get the limits off and have lots of liquidity, then I think uh, we'll, we'll drive that forward. Have lots of liquidity uh, does that mean forcing everybody to buy and sell arm's length on those markets? I don't or, or think you not? have to force them uh, as long as you're making sure that what uh, you um, are, are having in terms of renewables is there. And uh, the moment all those renewable shares are there, the others will want to be there as well. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for getting us uh, started. So I'm going to move to... Um, I'll pass on. Now, I'm told that I'm allowed to call you Alp, which, which makes my life just so much easier. Um, so, Alp, could you, um, you, you, you've, you have two roles. You have a Turkish role, but you also have your international role. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and good morning, everyone. I know we're about to get to lunch. Uh, and also, I would like to thank um, the Kaiso for giving me this opportunity to be here. It's a real privilege uh, to be here today, this morning. Uh, I would like to take, take you from here to, uh, to Europe, from Europe to, to the, the rest of the world, China, e Asia, Africa, uh, Middle East, and there are so many things going on uh, in these regions as well. Uh, in my capacity in ICER, International Confederation of Energy Regulators, I'm able to see the developments in these regions as well. But at the end of the day, there are two main issues that drive our major energy discussions all over the world security of supply, and the climate change. If we don't implement adequate plans, there is an obvious risk in supply security. Uh, and, if, and for the climate change, we need to sort out a new way of getting energy. And we, we, we need to sort out a new way of using energy. And as a regulator, we are trying to have a competitive energy markets, financially viable, stable, transparent markets to ensure reliable and affordable energy supply to consumers. We heard a lot yesterday uh, here as well. Uh, and in an environmentally friendly manner, of course. Uh, sounds is clear, I mean, the objectives are clear, but it is not an easy job, easy task to, or easy uh, target to achieve. Uh, we can uh, ask a couple of questions, how we are gonna be able to deal with address security of supply uh, challenge, how we are gonna make our energy system more resilient, more flexible, and provide sustainable development through efficient climate change measures, and how we are going to create efficient regional market conditions, which is going to support the competitiveness of the industry, uh, reliability of the system, and uh, secure, securing energy supply for consumers. Uh, there are other questions, renewable penetration, we all talk about uh, throughout this symposium, 
and impact of low commodity prices that you raised, Michael, yesterday on the system flexibility and security. At the end of the day, I believe we have to end up some harmonized solutions. And the solutions should be effective, should be economically viable, but also politically and publicly acceptable. An energy union, the, the, the energy uh, policy in, in European Union, is trying to harmonize all the solutions. And there are three pillars of the energy union's uh, energy uh, policy in, in Europe. First, sustainability through support of renewable energy penetration and energy efficiency. And the second thing is competitiveness through market integration, which again we discuss a lot in, in this uh, symposium. Uh, and we're talking about the market integration continental scale. It's, it's a huge uh, task. Uh, it's not easy. As Antonella mentioned a little bit, uh, or maybe York mentioned uh, in his uh, speech, 23 officially recognized language uh, we are talking about in Europe. It's, it's not easy to harmonize all these things. And the market levels are different. I mean, some countries, in terms of market opening, liberalization is an advanced level in Europe, and some are... Uh, very at the very beginning of the uh, market opening or uh, introducing the uh, retail market competition. So in EU, uh, European Union, to reach these goals, the first uh, point is uh, to use existing infrastructure more efficient, more efficiently. Secondly, to improve the market design. And uh, the, for the expansion, EU needs also efficient infrastructure planning and implementation. And harmonization of framework guidelines and network codes and implementation and monitoring are the key tools to eventually provide some tangible benefits for e consumers. Thanks to Antonella mentioning about more about the consumers, we haven't heard much uh, during the uh, symposium, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to provide some tangible uh, benefits for consumers. And there are some other areas that the, uh, the regulators uh, can play some substantial role end users energy efficiency measures, the operation and development of strong networks, which are necessary for not only connect national markets to each other, but also incorporates renewables producers and consumers to the grid. Empowering energy consumers. I believe it is important because it helps consumers, saves money, saves energy through better information and giving consumers a wider choice and a higher level of consumer protection is, is an important thing. And although, Michael, I agree with you that the sometimes consumers uh, doesn't, don't uh, pick the right choice, economically right choice, but we have to give them wider choice anyway, and we have to educate them, engage them uh, to the energy markets. Energy storage and smart grid solutions, which again help consumers and us to be active in the market and allow renewables and dispatchable generators to be more flexible while ensuring safe network operation. We can play a very significant role in all these fronts, but we need to have a new and better regulatory thinking and approaches with institutional innovation. We have to talk, we, we talk a lot about the technological innovation. We are in, a, in California and we are like a capital of the innovation, but not only technological innovation, but also social aspect, you mentioned Antonella, social innovation and institutional innovation are key thing. And to improve the competency of the regulators, which in ICER and in other regional associations that we are trying to achieve, uh, to, to surpass all these challenges, competent regulators are crucially important. And one of the most efficient tools to do this, I think uh, cooperation among all stakeholders and I think this is a very good opportunity and a very good example uh, for this cooperation. Thank you. So th thank you very much, Al. That's really great. It's, um, that was a, a, a tour of a number of the issues that I think we're going to draw, draw out uh, in the discussion. Um, and particularly, you, you've, I think you've really emphasized consumers more than we've heard so far here. And I think that's a great um, theme. Although um, Boris also talked about it yesterday over dinner. And, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on you know, the issue that you know, 80% of consumers want renewable energy, 
but then when you say, do you pay a bit more, then it's 60%. Well, okay, it's still a majority, it's still okay. But if you say, and then you're going to be able to see it, or it's going to be some pylons that, that, uh, that, that affect a, uh, a, a much-loved uh, Vista, then suddenly it drops to 20%. Now that's Germany, and in the UK, it kind of starts at 51% and goes down from there. Um, and how do you, and you know, to what extent, I suppose, since this is a panel about regulation, you know, do the, does the regulator, can, are there things the regulator can do to try to deal with this kind of NIMBY issue or however you want to characterize it? Oh, there is obviously no uh, silver bullet for this, but uh, what we believe, and we uh, strongly emphasize the empowering consumers, uh, one side is, again, educating them, engage them to the whole system, and being, being uh, transparent, provide enough information, uh, and the whole thing, the, the climate change and deal with the climate change uh, uh, problems, that you have to engage uh, all stakeholders, not only industry, not only, uh, but household, commercial users, and uh, eventually you, they have to better understand what are the ma market dynamics. We're not expecting them to understand the, the complexity of the or sophisticated uh, market issues, but at least their role uh, in terms of using energy efficiently uh, and their uh, contribution to climate uh, change mitigation. So uh, it's our role is to empower them, to inform them uh, through various ways uh, and uh, again being transparent all of the activities that we are doing. Let me just push a little bit more on that. Some of the issues that the consumers respond to there, they are not in your remit. They're actually to do with planning and land use um, regulations. Do you, in Turkey, or do your members internationally, are they building closer links with those regulators or those government departments? Uh, it seems that would be very important. I agree, but... Uh that's another point that I think the regulators, when we talk about the cooperation among stakeholders, it's not only the, the stakeholders in energy field, but the EPAs uh, in, in all over the world or the other uh, regulators. Uh, I include financial regulators, the banking regulators, security exchange commissioners, so all uh, stakeholders because it's very much linked to each other. And as you raise the uh, land issue is another uh, aspect of it. I, I think this cooperation in all fronts are uh, quite important. So um, I, th I agree with you entirely. I think that the, uh, particularly I've done a lot of work with financial regulators and it's actually quite hard still to get them in the room to, to think about these issues. Um, and, but it's getting there, it's actually improving considerably. So we've got this fabulous audience, uh, but it needs to grow and we need to bring in other stakeholders from other uh, other branches and uh, not just governments but also uh, also business and so on so there we go um, now our um, our third speaker I'm going to turn to Luigi Miki who is the uh, head of strategy at uh, Terna uh, uh, Luigi you are a TSO and uh, the floor is yours okay oh, well, thank, thank you everybody thank you for inviting me here uh, today uh, I think there should be a reason for sitting in the green chair you know because I'm yeah I, I am the old guy uh, behind the enemy lines uh, for, uh, for, from a certain perspective. But, uh, uh, I would like to, to start with this snapshot uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, don't, don't get scared about this, all these figures, but it just to, 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 um, to tell you that uh, over the last, uh, say, uh, eight to ten years, there was a, a number of no return changes in Italy. And so, uh, and the a sort of perfect storm coming up from a combination of um, three, at least three factors. First of all, the uh, I, I would say the camel carve. Can I can I name that like that? An animal, another animal. A camel ca carve is the uh, the camel ca carve of the demand. You know. The camel, yeah, camel, sorry for my strong accent. Because nowadays, uh, Italy has uh, demand is around, like the Californian one, 300 billion kilowatt hours, but it's, it's just likely the one we had in 2002. So due to the uh, tremendous crisis we had in 2008, 2009, throughout all Europe, we had that drop in terms of demand and at the same time, later on, starting, we, we started from scratch, see that we had a massive increase in terms of renewables, uh, soaring to nearly 30 gigawatt. 
two thirds of which are solar and one third wind. Uh, it, uh, is that all? Not at all, because due to a wrong interpretation, my vision of the short term signals of the day had market, a lot of investors in 2004, 2005, till 2012 started to build new gas power stations in Italy, uh, coming up to 30,000 gigawatt, gigawatts. So a number of gigawatts uh, entered into, into the market to the extent that now the installed capacity is around 120. 120 gigawatt, it's an enormous amount of installed capacity. Uh, we, and, and it's exactly the uh, margin reserve every TSO would have had, you know, because it's a paradise for a TSO. Is that true? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Now look at what happened on the, on the uh, right bottom part of the, of, the, of the chart. All the oil fleet was disposed. Okay, that's nice. All the new, or a good portion of the new uh, gas combined cycle power station are going to be disposed. Look as the uh, green uh, green curve, while the green uh, sorry the the gray curve while the green curve is rising up. So renewables entering the uh, gas stay power station are going to be disposed or progressively disposed. Oil is not there anymore. Uh, this is the the start point. Uh, Patrick said that you should not be afraid. I, know, I was saying two days ago. We, uh, we are just changing the tires of the car while he's, he's running. Oh, the first thing I, I, I wanted to say, I would not any other one to change my tires. I would like to change my tires while the car is running if I'm compelled to do that. And effectively, the, 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 I think that the great message here and the great thing I discovered, and that's why I'm so thrilled to be here, is the fact that I'm sharing the same issues of all the other TSOs and ISOs, <clears throat> and uh, the, un the only difference is the number of remedies and tools and, uh, and, uh, and the extension of the um, initiative and action you should uh, undertake in order to face this kind of issues. A quick question. On your fourth chart down there, there's a blue line that says other, and other hasn't really changed. Can you talk to us about, the, you see on your fourth chart, it's not the oil has gone out of the mix, we see renewables has grown, gas, the big bulge, and then it's coming down. What's happening in other? Can you see that? Yeah. There's, well, there, I'm assuming there's a bunch of coal and some... Well, we built up all the large hydros in the 60s, you know, and to be uh, and large hydro heads was mentioned by Jorges, I suppose. We have a, a number of important <clears throat> hydropower plants on the Alps, and above all, uh, at least 7,000 pump storage power plants, which are, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a good flexibility reserve, and we can get back to that later. So the other are exactly all the plants which are useful, but can be uh, somehow adjusted in terms of capacity. Okay, I was just interested because you're seeing the gas being forced out of the system, but not, but not yeah. those. No. And that's something we've seen. That's a theme in Europe where preferentially gas is being shut down and uh, in, in Germany, uh, coal being used and, and so on. So I was just wondering if there's a parallel of that situation in Italy. Well, if in Italy, well, Italy is still gas driven. It's still gas driven. So gas is, anyway, the marginal cost. Pardon? No, I'm just yeah, talking. I, pa Patrick's dying to jump in, but I'm going to ask him to jumping. wait. He's jumping. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I, I, I can't see the, the face of Patrick. I don't know why. I, I, I am, do not forget that I, I'm sitting in the green chair. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, your green line, okay. uh, your, your well, green line there looked very, looks very healthy. And in fact, all of these, the, um, I, I, I'm glad that I used Australia yesterday as an example yeah, of the well, overestimate uh, yeah. of... Uh, you, you used Australia, but you could have used even my case, because I was one of the guys who launched the, 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 the positive slope one year after year, year after year. The, you know, look at the caramel carve, you know. If I come back again, if I'm invited back... Think how back, many mistakes I did. You know. So if I am invited back, then next year I'll do Australia, and then I'll do Italy, and then I'll do California, and I'll do... Uh, there'll be a whole bunch of... We call, them, we call I, those I, I, yeah, hedgehog I think they charts, because yeah. that's what they look like. Yeah. There were a bunch of people make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's very... 
That's very, very honest, and it's a, I think it's a sign of, the, uh, of, of the, um, the good relationships that have been built up that we're able to be honest like that. Um, now, I'm going to uh, move to the UK and um, uh, Andrew Burgess, and the UK uh, is really, um, I mean, there's really interesting stuff going on. It's the first time for 20-something years that there's a majority Tory government and, uh, and a lot of scrutiny of the announcements so far and a lot of rhetoric. And uh, maybe, Andrew, you can help us to sort of sort what's really happening from some of the political posturing that I think has been part of, uh, of, that, uh, the, of, that, of that early uh, few months of the new government. Okay, well, I'm, I'm a regulator, so I'm going to start with the regulatory perspective. And I just wanted to make a couple of general points about economic regulation and the role of the regulator. And then to talk about a couple of things that we at Ofgem, the energy regulator for the UK, uh, have been doing which might be of interest to you. So I guess on the, on the general side, if you think about the role of the regulator, um, we're really trying to make imperfect markets work in consumers' interests and to improve competition, to deal with monopoly elements and to make sure that the market rules are fit for purpose. And I think we need to be very careful as regulators because Sometimes doing nothing as a regulator is absolutely the best thing to do. Sometimes it's absolutely the worst thing to do. Um, equally, intervening can be the right thing to do if it's the right intervention and doesn't have any wider adverse consequences. Intervening in the wrong way can cause lots of long-term problems. So the regulator needs to be, to be very careful in how, to make, how, how they make markets work and need to think very carefully about the messages they send. I think in the UK, we've got quite a long history of having independent economic regulators. So that's regulators who are independent of the politicians. Um, and the reason for that is to create some sort of long-term certainty for investors in markets, for people who want to enter markets, and for the people who are in the markets already. So I think regulation is a very important role, but really we're about making things happen and influencing behaviour. And I think just as the world is changing and the world is getting smarter, regulation needs to get smarter. And at Ofgem, we've done a couple of things um, in recent years that, that might be of interest. So first of all, on the network side, we reviewed our approach to regulating network monopolies, so regulating the transmission companies, the system operator, the distribution companies. And we came up with a new approach to regulation, which we call RIO, which is revenue equals incentives plus innovation plus outputs. And generally, the companies get some money for an eight-year period. They have to deliver outputs by the end of that eight-year period, but they're free to decide how and when they deliver those outputs within reason. Um, and there are mechanisms to stimulate innovation. So we run annual competitions for the network companies to engage with third parties outside the normal energy sector to bring forward innovative ideas to test on the network. And that's about changing behavior and having solutions to some of the challenges we, we face. We've also um, dealt with the, um, the bias towards capital investment and a return on capital investment uh, by considering operating expenditure and capital expenditure together so the network companies can explore smart solutions. And then more recently, at the end of September, we published a position paper on flexibility um, saying why we thought it was important and which areas we wanted to focus on. And we're focusing on demand side response on the industrial and commercial side, the regulatory framework for aggregators and storage, and how the roles of the, the distribution and transmission networks and the system operator should evolve to deal with all the new challenges. And then finally, um, around the same time, we also published the results of a consultation we conducted. And we basically consulted on non-traditional business models. So we asked the world in the UK and anyone else who was interested whether people who were doing things differently to the way they've been done in the past felt that there were obstacles in the regulatory system or the legal system which was stopping them entering the market um, and being able to provide services to consumers. Um, we had um, a very, very big response. We're now going through the response, but I think a lot of them were in the area of flexibility. And I think the, the key message is that regulators need to keep the rules under review. They need to make sure 
the, the rules are fit for purpose and allow new entry. But in doing that, they also need to provide enough, enough certainty for investors um, so there's some stability um, in the regulatory framework. Thank you very much. And uh, let me just come back to the, the question of sort of the, con the consumer, but, but in terms of the political consensus for this. Because you know, if I look at what you're doing and I look at what's happening in Germany, probably the key difference is that there is a general acceptance, I think it's fair to say, in Germany, we've heard it from Boris, we've heard it from Patrick, um, that there is an energy transition, that there is an energy vendor, and it's a good thing. And there's a lot of willingness to work. The different stakeholder groups do work together, and there is a consensus about the direction of travel. Uh, the UK, for those not following the sort of uh, UK political situation and the press in the UK, um, it's kind of like here. Um, it's very, very polarized. Um, how does that impact on your freedom to operate, your freedom to try things, maybe have things. Innovation also involves failure. So how does that, does that political environment concern you? Um, we obviously have to be very conscious of the political environment. Um, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't affect us at a, at a high level because we, we're clear about establishing the right environment for consumers and we're independent of the politicians. But obviously it does have an impact. Um, so I think the more, I think where you get governments subsidizing or introducing incentive mechanisms, say for renewable energy, the more certainty about what the government's approach is, then the better. Um, if the approach is volatile, that can cause problems. So um, that can find its way into the way in which network companies choose to invest. You know, how much solar is there going to be? How much renewable generation is there going to be? the more certainty that, that can come from government about the long-term plan, then the better for everyone, I think. Okay, good. And then I'm going to move now to uh, Ike, who's our final panelist to bring into the discussion. Uh, Ike, director of the Fraunhofer Institute. I hope you all know Fraunhofer has just been one of the extraordinary uh, powerhouse research institutes in lots of things, but also in um, solar. So what does the, Ike, what does the future uh, look like? Well, I think... Uh, I can bring a completely different approach to the discussion which we had by now. Because Al has said so very clearly, and this is very much the consensus. On the one hand side, we want to change to a new energy system which still guarantees security of supply and taking care for the issue of climate change. And I think we all know, as we are sitting here right now, maybe the strongest storm which humankind ever experienced on this earth is brewing with wind speeds of 325 kilometers per hour, which is something I have never heard of up to now. So the issue of climate change is indeed an extremely pressing issue. But nevertheless, I would like to add another very important argument. And this is, this is simply the economically most sensible way to go. Just look at this graph. This is a graph, and Michael, this is the one I hope you are using in the future in your presentations, uh, where we combined our knowledge of technology development with our knowledge of the price digression curve with further installations. Let's start in the year 2015. In the year 2015, as we speak, we can generate electricity from sunshine in sun-rich conditions at less than five cents per kilowatt hours. And if we go along towards 2050, we are talking about electricity for two cents per kilowatt hour. And this is really now a number where we can forget practically everything else. Maybe old hydropower, which has been written off, uh, reaches similar amounts, you know? So the point which I want to make is, after we have spent really enormous amount of money, and especially Germany has done it, China has as well done it because they supported the investments in uh, manufacturing, we are now facing the fact that going into the renewables, going solar, is really the best way to guarantee a safe, cost-effective energy system. If I see the stupidity in England, where we, they right now talk about building another huge uh, nuclear power plant, 
which needs a guaranteed price for electricity of 11 cents per kilowatt hour with inflation adjustment in the next 35 years. So pretty soon they are sitting on this power for 12, 13, 14, 15 cents a kilowatt hour if they could have solar for 5 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, if we take the $5 billion dollars which it costs to build a nuclear power plant, you could build enough PV factories to create each year five gigawatt of additional PV capacity. So the speed in which we can introduce this technology in the next couple of years will be much faster than even we expect. And honestly, Michael, I am a big optimist on solar. And in the last 10 years, I was always off too low in my expectations. And where we are going shows the next curve, which I think is as well for some of you a surprising curve, especially as it is from the International Energy Agency. One of the scenarios they produce shows on the right-hand side, if we look at the year 2050, we expect installations of 5,000 gigawatts of PV. And as a matter of fact, this was only correspond to using PV for 5% of the world energy need. I don't see any reason why in 2050, with two cents per kilowatt hours, we will not have 30,000 gigawatts of PV installed. The direct harvesting of nuclear fusion energy, because the sun is the most gigantic nuclear fusion reactor, in a very safe way down here on Earth, using our modern technology uh, called photovoltaics. But the most important message is, look where we are today. We need a magnifying glass to see in the left lower corner that today we have installed worldwide 200 gigawatts. So the biggest growth and the biggest time for this incredible revolution in front of us is still ahead of us. And the real question is, of course, which countries, which companies are intelligent enough to really see where we are heading and what is coming across us. So I see right now Germany is doing a very, very bad job because the German government has basically killed the additional PV market. We are down to a one gigawatt market. The United States goes the other way. We have now in Albany the new uh, factory for uh, PV. And of course, China is going big way. But China is pretty saturated. They have 50 gigawatts of uh, installed production capacity. They need only 10. The world market, which is today at 50 gigawatts annual installations, is expected to grow, and I think Michael told me they, you agree with that, to 100 gigawatt in 2020. But today, the production capacity is only 50 gigawatts. So this means in the next five years, we will have to add the same amount of production capacity which we built in the last 20 years. So there will be, I call it the second wave of photovoltaic, and it is just starting as we speak here. We will have a very exciting time. And my very final slide, if I am allowed to show this, shows we don't have to be afraid. And I think the message has already come across. But this message which you see here, I think nobody of you has expected this. This message shows what happens. The green line shows the increase of fluctuating renewables in the German grid. It has doubled since 2006. And the red line shows how many minutes the German grid system failed per year. In 2006, we had a very stable grid system. We had power plants running 24 hours, nuclear power plants, oil-fired gas plants, uh, coal-fired power plants. However, the grid at that time was adjusted to this very stable situation. And if something unexpected happened, a transformer blows up, a substation goes off, suddenly big disaster. The grid was not prepared for that. Today, our grid can only operate with all this changing and fluctuating renewables because IT technology takes care, and I think in the discussion which we just had uh, at this uh, panel here, how it works, you know, interconnecting with Norway, storage, everything comes in, and even the sun eclipse didn't make any problems because today's grid system is inherently so much more resilient, so much more stable than we had before. So where we are heading is a much more cost-effective, predictable energy supply we don't have to fear any more increases of oil and gas and coal prices. We don't care because we have a stable future in front of us. We will have 
plenty of lost assets. I feel very sorry about the energy companies which are investing crazy amounts of billions of dollars into drilling, fracking and other technologies which will never ever be returned on their investment. And I think for our economies and for the world economies, this is an extremely positive message that the energy problem will be solved with a very cost-effective, predictable energy supply based on renewables. So let's not be low-key, let's be very proud of what we have achieved so far and where we are heading. I think it's a very exciting future. It needs a lot of investments. For Germany alone, more than 500 billion euros. So it is an enormous economic stimulus program to make the transformation of our current energy system into the new world of the renewable-based energy system, but it will be good for all of us. Now, I want to ask, the, uh, just on a point of clarification on the um, cents per kilowatt hour, those were euro cents, so uh, were they? Yes. Or, okay, so That's can you translate cents. just very quickly, where are we on, on US cents and where are we going? Because it's, it feels to me it's... Well, it's 1.1, the factor is 10%, right. so it really... So we're talking you know, about, but still, it's, 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 it's going to be 3 cents solar, whether it's 2.5 or 3 or something like that out in, in 2050. No, no. I mean, as you saw, in 2050, we can even come below two euro cents, you know. Euro, because, but about two cents yeah, US. Yeah. Okay. And then, I mean, this is a tremendous and inspiring vision, um, but we have to start thinking about some of the implications, because uh, I can't do the maths in my head, but if you look at those 5,000 uh, gigawatts of supply, yeah. something like, I'm guessing, two-thirds of that is going to be generated in during the, a few hours either side of midday in summer. So what do we, see, what, how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? You see, I mean, we've got a duck curve you know, starting to develop here now. If we are going to install worldwide 3,000, 10,000, 30,000 gigawatts of PV, we will as well do what we are doing right now with Norway. We will have gigawatt scale interconnectors and the end of the story will be the worldwide supergrid because the sun shines on the earth at any hour of the day. So all we have to do is bring the electricity from where the sun shines to where we need it. So this is second half of the century. This so the, the Australia, our... China, uh, 50 gigawatt under, under the Pacific interconnector. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, now, obviously that is gonna be a bit of a regulatory challenge. We won't deal with that one uh, here uh, today. Um, but, um, let me, let me try and get some interaction between some of those comments before we move on. Patrick, you very much wanted to come in. I, I, mentioned, um, I, I mentioned gas being pushed out and not coal, and you almost leapt out of your chair there. So uh, what, what was your thought on that? Well, I mean, uh, yes, there, there are lots of myths all around. Uh, so one of those myths is uh, uh, Germany is all nice about it. Uh, and given about the, the end, the CO2 emissions are rising. Uh, and indeed what has happened, and that is uh, the case all over Europe, to be honest, is that uh, because coal is so cheap, we saw your slide uh, yesterday, um, and gas hasn't been becoming that cheap in Europe as it has in the US, um, and the third factor, our EU emissions trading system is currently not delivering. That combination has led to the situation that in all countries where there's both coal and gas, Currently, coal is out-competing gas. Um, the good news is uh, in the sense that, um, in a way, they've done that job now. And from now on, the emissions uh, are, are decreasing. 2014 emissions in Germany are down again. Uh, and that's uh, all over Europe. So um, yes, there is one thing taking care of renewables. But uh, I think we in Europe especially have a second job to do, and that is uh, uh, get real, rid of coal as well. And I think that's very important, you know, in case this becomes a kind of, you know, let's just do what Germany did, let's just put you know, Boris and, and Ike and Patrick in charge of everything, um, that uh, you know, essentially what Germany has done, the downside of the energy vendor has produced lots of renewables, it's enabled you to switch off some of the nuclear, but you outsourced the switch from coal to gas to the EU ETS, which didn't deliver. Is that a fair characterization? It is, it is. And, and, and in that sense, I have to commend you guys in the UK. For, for, for building more nuclear? No, be, if not. <laughs> well, actually, you know, uh, Ike has said anything, to, uh, everything that is said to be that. I mean, if, 
if you want to pay that in 20, 30 years from now, go ahead. I mean, uh, it's not my problem. But the other thing is, what you guys did was, as EU ETS was not delivering, there is a yes. carbon price in the UK, which as of uh, April, uh, went up to 18 pounds. Uh, which, the carbon uh, price floor, you mean, uh, yeah. where the so, market failed and so there was another yeah. intervention and, and to the, maintain and, and the floor. And that's yes. the way to do it. As, as a, because Brussels is currently uh, uh, too slow to act, uh, domestic uh, uh, has to be stepping in and uh, eventually your 18 pounds on top of the current 8 euros delivers some 30 euros uh, per ton of CO2, which is what we should be having all, in, all over Europe. Okay, yes. Learn from the UK. That would be really something new, right? Well, in, in some ways, you know, the UK has gone from when I started New Energy Finance, 3% renewables to 25% renewables for the cost of about half a cappuccino per household per week. So although one can be very critical of, of the UK, actually that's a pretty good performance. Um, but but this, this, this nuclear thing, which, um, uh, Andrew, do you, do, you want to, um, do you want to breach regulatory uh, protocol and, and say what, uh, what you really think about it and how it's going? But, or, or I'll give you a way out, which is talk about how do you deal with a system which is going to be, in the UK, enormous amounts of intermittency and then this monolithic block, which I personally believe is an absurdly long uh, commitment at an absurdly high price. So just to be absolutely clear, even though I was a nuclear engineer and I like nuclear, and close brackets, how do you deal with the intermittency that is going to become very substantial with North Sea wind, pushing up against a block that you can't really switch off? So I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the debate about whether the new nuclear plant is a good deal or not. But equally, I'm not going to defend it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're having a hard time finding someone in the UK who defends it, actually. <laughs> Somebody must be for um, it. I think you're right in it. it. It creates challenges having the different energy mix. I think we as regulators need to make sure that the, the system is able to cope with all that um, and that the, the investment in the infrastructure, I guess, on the one level, reflects the fact that if you have nuclear plants, then you need the transmission system to be able to transport the electricity out of there. But equally, if you have more and more flexibility, more and more renewable generation, you logically need less investment in the infrastructure. So I think there'll be some quite tricky times for us as regulators where we're trying to, to make the right call on whether we agree to the network company's investment plans because of, of the uncertainty between the two things. But it's, I think it's, it, it's, it's incumbent on us to consult as widely as possible to get industry views and to try to make sure that the framework is flexible enough to deal with different situations. So we'll come back to the issue of consulting and stakeholders. I think it's a very important one. Um, but innovation, um, it, 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 you know, this sort of constant churn of new regulation also has a corrosive effect. So there's some sort of a trade-off between innovating and providing the longer-term signals for long-term investments, which is what uh, the TSOs and the, and the DNOs and, and indeed the generators really need. How do you think about the trade-off, and, and, and I'll, I'm going to come to you to ask you the same question, that how do we get flexibility but without destroying market and investor confidence? So I think it probably goes back to what I said at the beginning about regulators having to be really careful in making the right call about when to intervene and when not to. It's about, I guess, at the basic level, removing undue barriers to new entry. And I think flexibility has fantastic um, potential. Um, and one of the interesting things is we don't know what new services, what new entry there will be. And we shouldn't foreclose that. So we, we have to, I think, be open about what we're doing and try and make sure that the market rules evolve, but in a way which is transparent and which creates some certainty. And I just yep. finally, just I mentioned our framework for network regulation. Within that, we have uncertainty mechanisms. So where there is a known uncertainty, where we can't make a decision up front when we're reviewing the company's expenditure plans, we put in place a mechanism showing what we would do if something changes. 
So although we can't give investors the result, we can give them some certainty about how we would address any particular uncertainty or any particular change, and I think that probably helps markets. But let me just challenge you there, because what you're essentially saying is we'll be really, really, really good at our job. There is an alternative, which we saw in the 1980s in the telecoms industry, which is we will admit that we can't possibly anticipate all the services. You know, the telecoms, they said, well, we, we can't anticipate Facebook and Snapchat and Viber, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore, to the greatest extent possible, we will open up, we will make sure that this is a welcoming industry for new entrants, and we will then let the market uh, uh, develop to the greatest extent possible. We will simply stop doing our job, not trying to perfect doing it. Is there any argument for doing that in, in regulation of, on, on these issues? As we really have to talk about massive regionalization and it all becomes incredibly complex, can you really control that centrally? So, so I th think I probably agree with you that I don't think regulators should control it. Um, and I think we shouldn't leap to regulate anything that ends, enters the market. I think that's very important. I think the, the difficulty, certainly in the UK and I think probably elsewhere in Europe, is you have existing industry and commercial rules which have been developed for the existing market structure. Yeah. And so doing nothing means that those market rules will get in the way of new entry. So it's, I guess, guess the, the basic job is removing the undue barriers in those market rules and then hoping that new entry comes in and if it doesn't, being prepared to, to look again at some of those rules to make sure that things do happen. Very interesting. You talk about removing barriers because a lot of the theme of the regionalization is about expanding the, the, the markets and bringing in more liquidity, but actually identifying barriers. Alp, do you want to come in at this point? Well, when it comes to investment, uh, I think it was 2013, one of your uh, summit in New York, uh, Bloomberg New Energy uh, Finance Summit, and uh, I think you're doing a great organization and you're asking some uh, pollings, you know, electronic pollings. And it, the question was, what are the biggest challenges in energy investment, in front of the energy investment? And the answer is, the majority in the, in the room, maybe 600 people, said 80-something uh, percent regulatory risk. So it was us, the, uh, the one who will blame uh, for that. I mean, when it comes to energy investment, a couple of figures I would like to uh, share with you. According to IEA, I know your figure a little bit different, but every single year the world needs 1.6 to $2 trillion investment. And now the, the countries are pledging for COP21 and every, until 2030 maybe $4 trillion investment, cumulative investment required in renewables between now and 2030. And when you look at the U Europe, it's almost 100 billion euros every single year until 2030 uh, to integrate, integrating renewables and to, to reach this low carbon uh, uh, emissions and uh, targets. So these are significant numbers and when we look at the, the, the outcome or solutions, I think the uh, administrative signals or the regulated rates of return at the end of the day are the ones who attract uh, the, the investment, private capital and private investment. So we need to have a concerted effort to remove the barriers and to reduce these political and regulatory uncertainties. Uh, again, I mean, uh, to uh, avoid all these um, uh, over-regulation problem, uh, unpredictability, it's, it's maybe we should intervene or not intervene. Uh, but I agree with you that uh, I think uh, because the regulator sometimes doesn't understand the real market dynamics, it doesn't uh, follow very closely what's happening in the market. So it's, I think, better to not to uh, intervene uh, very often uh, and uh, to create a more level playing field for the market players. Thank you very much. Luigi, you were looking very pensive there about the, your light touch, and maybe you were still thinking well, back to your, how do you do that? How do you get that part of that 100 billion of investment when you have such overcapacity? Maybe that was what you were considering. I'm not sure. Well, um, let me say that, that I, I can't, from a TSO perspective and eh, standpoint, yeah. I can't say don't be afraid, you know, because this sounds more like a Pope's recommendation. Than, well, I can't say that. But, 
But, but the good news is that I'm sharing, I'm totally sh sharing what my colleagues previously uh, said here. Um, there is a great chance and possibility, a concrete possibility to deal with this uh, large feat of renew renewables. And the possibility uh, lies on the two main guidelines, okay, which uh, um, as well are going to preserve the investment and of course making um, uh, uh, the, the, the old, not efficient part of the fleet to be disposed. And the guidelines are, first, to uh, strengthen as much as possible interconnections. And yesterday I picked up uh, one sp a specific point from the regulator's uh, panel, and the point was, uh, uh, one, I don't remember the name, and I beg your pardon, but say, uh, clearly said, uh, it's important to shrink the dispatching times and to spread the energy out. And this is ex essentially, it's essentially the second part of the sentence is just uh, enhancing the interconnections and making the grid more robust than it is now. The second, but the first part is more like, is more uh, close to the market redesign or design there is a, f a strong effort in Europe to des properly design the market, making it closer to the real time, and doing that, um, giving the chance to the renewables to correctly operate in the market and to receive the right short-term signals. On the other side, some, yeah, I know you are not so in line with me with, uh, with this point, but some long-term signals must be sent to the market in order to uh, make people do the right invest, make make the right right investment decisions. Oh, and, and I don't think we, you, you say that we don't agree. I think that's absolutely, that's the challenge in a sense. Uh, the challenge that I posed to Andrew is how do you deal with renewables and nuclear? But there's an analogous challenge in time terms, which is how do you deal with the very, you know, we, we need to get the system reacting on, on, the, yeah. on the minute basis, but, the, but for infrastructure investment, there will be some element of requiring of, of long-term PPAs, long-term um, commitments. And how do you square that circle? Uh, exactly, uh, yeah, right. There is some investment to be uh, designed and the proper uh, tools to be put in place. At the same time, I think that uh, there should be a sort of toolbox. Uh, so the toolbox inside has a, a lot of um, think a lot of stuff and compensators, reactors, storage. Well, ye yesterday I was impressed by your merit order. You're perfectly right when you say there is a merit order. And the merit order is in the hand of each ICO or TSO. And uh, it's up to the TSO to choose the right tool at the right time, in the right location. This is the merit order to deal with intermittency that I talked yeah, about exactly. yesterday. Uh, yeah. exactly. Well, uh, uh, and we, or which is the same, to, 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 to leverage on the flexibility as much as you can. Now, we're not going to have time, unfortunately, to take questions from the floor. I was uh, not sure whether we would or wouldn't, um, but I'm sure all these uh, gentlemen, uh, and sadly it is all gentlemen, uh, Angelina, I don't know how that happened, um, but um, they'll, they'll be milling around at lunchtime. But what I'd like to do to finish is we talked about stakeholder engagement, we've talked about the importance of uh, uh, bringing in learnings and sharing them, but I'd like to have any thoughts on that issue, stakeholders or learnings, and particularly anything uh, that you've picked up from the last two days here. Who wants to go first? Ike, you, you, you want to go first? I'm personally extremely impressed and grateful for the opportunity which we have here. We had done a similar visit uh, one and a half years ago to Germany from California regulators, and Steve and his team were there. I do believe this is extremely important because at least I can say in Germany right now we experience a very strong wave from classical stakeholders, those who are behind earning money with the old energy system and they get scared to death that their business models disappear. And in Germany I hear it and Patrick heard it that you know we Germans are so crazy, you know, we shut down our nuclear power plants and the next is we shut down our coal-fired power plants and at the end we shut down our light because we don't have safety power anymore. So I think 
coming together in this type of arrangement between Europe and the United States, and especially California as a forerunner in the United States, is very important because we strengthen us. We not only exchange best practices and what can we do technically, administratively, regulatory, but as well the political support, the support by society, by saying what we are doing here in California is going on in Europe, in Germany, and we can say in Germany what we are striving for, California and other states are going along very strongly, is so important. So I'm very grateful for this forum, and we should continue coming together in the right uh, time sequence to continue this uh, dialogue. Thanks very much. And who wants to have the closing remark? Al, do you want to give us a closer? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, oh, then Patrick. Patrick will give the closer then. Uh, I would like to say uh, one thing, uh, and I think we, we haven't talked much about the, the human capital and human uh, the role in, 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 the, in the energy field. And uh, as a, one of the roles of ICER, International Confederation of Energy Regulators, to improve the awareness of the, uh, uh, the public, uh, the, the regulator's role, on the other hand, to improve the competency of the regulators in, in, in energy field. And one of the uh, activities or the initiative that we are taking is uh, very much linked to what you uh, raised uh, here, Michael, uh, about the woman. Woman in Energy Initiative in ICER is uh, one of the activities that we are developing and to advancement of women working in energy field. It could be in industry, it could be in regulation or in a political level uh, by increasing their visibility uh, in energy field, so I would like to uh, uh, just remind you or uh, inform you about this initiative and I would like to encourage all women uh, here in this room and also in their workplace uh, to become uh, part of this initiative. Uh, so that's, that's my final remarks. Thank you. Uh, Very quickly. The, we the website, ICER website, uh, ICER-regulators.net, uh, would be a, a, a good source for that. Uh, but you can communicate all the regulators uh, in, in the States. They, they know NARUK is uh, very active on that front. So I think it's okay. a good thing. And empowering women is one of the key things uh, to reach all these uh, goals uh, in the world. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And now Patrick. Maybe I, I would like to have raise an issue for everyone to take home for the next meeting. Because one thing we really didn't touch much upon is if, if, if ICA is right in the terms of cost of PV, then everyone is going to have, have that on his home ho rooftop, plus the, the Tesla battery. So what is our regulation? What is our new type of uh, tariff structure? in a world where there's lots of homegrown electricity. And I, I, I do commend uh, that regulators should not even think about regulating against that, but rather embracing it and uh, finding out how that new world can really work together. Thank you very much, Patrick. Now, um, in a second, I'm going to hand back to Steve, who's going to give some closing thoughts. But I'll just share a, a couple um, from my own uh, day and a half here, um, and that is that there is a transition, and you know it, it sounds obvious, and you see it day to day. But there are, I can tell you, stakeholders out there who do not believe that there's anything fundamental changing uh, in the electric, uh, electricity system in the world. And so, you know, one message, loud and clear, and we all have to go out and we have to tell politicians, we have to help tell the business community civic society and so on, this is happening. It is manifestly happening. Um, and one of the messages for the last few days is it's not something to be scared of. It's not something, it's something to be managed. It is a task, not a, not a problem, to deal with some of the impacts of that uh, transition. And a further theme is that dealing with that is all about I put it up there yesterday as interconnection, but it's actually re my new favorite word, regionalization. And by the way, it may be if Ike is right, it becomes globalization, not just regionalization. But increasing the span uh, of managing these problems is absolutely critical to doing it at a cost-effective price. Absolutely critical. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up with a transition, but at a very high economic, and economic cost means a very high social um, cost. 
And so uh, those are, th that's, what, that's what we are going to see, what we're going to need to see. And I'm going to set you a challenge to do with the duck curve, because uh, I've still got one eye on lunch. Um, and that is that a duck curve, in other words, a, a, a belly of a, of a duck that appears at a predictable time of the day or of the week or of the month or of the year is a sign of failure. It's a sign of failure. Negative power prices are not a sign of failure. Volatility is not a sign of failure. Volatility is a price signal that participants will use to respond to and to deal with these problems. But if it's predictably happening at any time, then that's an argument that something hasn't happened because that is a sign that there is overproduction that is not being put to its best possible use. Duck curves are a sign of failure. So let's have a duck-free world except for at lunch. Thank you very much. Please thank our panel.